Welcome to Conversation. I'm Muqtadar Khan, your host. And as you can see today with me, I have Ghazala Wahab, one of the most prominent uh, journalists and commentators and scholars on India's national security issues and defense. Uh, she is uh, the editor or co-editor of The Force magazine, India's most complete magazine on national security issues. And uh, Ghazala, I want to congratulate you. It's 20 years for Force now, right? <laughs> you started in August 2003. Mm -hmm. So congratulations on that. Uh, Ghazala contributed a chapter on India's uh, defense preparedness, India's power projection capabilities uh, in our book that we published recently, as you're aware. Uh, the New Lines Institute published uh, my edited volume called uh, The Rise of India as a World Power, and Ghazala contributed a chapter to it. Uh, and in the video description of this uh, video, I will post a link uh, to the book and also a link to her chapter. So you can get it. Uh, New Lines Institute has been generous. It is free, so you can simply download the PDF and read the book. Ghazala is also the author of three interesting books. Her first book is called Dragon on Our Doorstep. It's about China and how India can face China uh, militarily, essentially. Her second book, Born a Muslim, which won two awards, and her latest book, Peacemakers. Mm -hmm. I will also post a link to her books uh, in the video description. So you all, all of you who in India in particular who are interested can buy and read uh, those books. Uh, so before I start talking to her about her chapter, uh, please do the needful, I call it office work, which is subscribe to conversations, ring the bell icon, like the video, and also don't forget to share it with your friends and your network. And one more thing, those of you who have been watching the channel for a while and like it, uh, do consider joining the channel in order to support it. Uh, so without further uh, ado, Ghazala, welcome to Conversations. In your chapter, I'm going to dive straight away into the chapter. You, uh, The book talks a lot about how India is becoming uh, uh, a major world power and the rise of India and what the drivers of India's uh, uh, diplomatic rise, economic growth, uh, the power of India's diaspora. So we, most of the chapters are very upbeat about India becoming a major power. But your chapter is quite critical and it questions uh, whether India is truly a major power by raising a very interesting test. And your test of power is the capacity of a country to deter its enemies, and since you argue that India has failed to deter in its uh, to deter its primary uh, hostile powers like China and Pakistan, uh, uh, the, it raises the question of how powerful India really is. Can you speak a little bit more to that and give us uh, some depth to the argument that you made in the chapter? Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Khan. Um, uh, coming to the issue of our capability or capacity to deter our uh, adversaries. Uh, we've had, uh, I'm, let's take Pakistan first, because in India, uh, the only adversary we talk openly about is Pakistan. So we've had a number of wars with Pakistan. And uh, except for the 1971 war, where we had a, a undoubted victory in the eastern sector, uh, not in the Western sector, uh, all our wars with Pakistan have ended in a stalemate. Uh, there was always a give and take at the negotiating table. They took some stuff, uh, some territory uh, during war. We took some of their territory during war. And when we sat down to discuss, uh, we exchanged the captured territory. So th there has never been a victory against Pakistan in the Western sector. If indeed there was a victory, then we wouldn't have had a military line uh, between India and Pakistan uh, in the entire state of Jammu and Kashmir. We, we would have decisively and militarily settled this issue long ago. We've not been able to do that. Uh, as far as uh, the internal implication of this uh, lack of deterrence is concerned, uh, there has been a problem in Kashmir um, since 47 onwards, 
the people uh, of Kashmir wanted a different outcome for themselves uh, when India won independence. Uh, the government of India made some uh, gave some some assurances, made some pledges, but nothing of that sort ever happened, and this disaffection continued. But despite this disaffection. Uh, there was no violence in the valley. There was always a sentiment of us versus them. The Kashmiris always regarded themselves as Kashmiris and not as Indians. And people who came from India to go to Kashmir for holidays or whatever reason were regarded as Indians. So they always made this distinction between us and them. But when the violent insurgency uh, broke out in 1989 and Pakistan saw the opportunity and started supporting it, if we had the capacity to deter Pakistan in the next five years, 10 years, 15 years, we would have been able to end the violent insurgency in Kashmir, which we have not been able to do so. Uh, the, it continues, Pakistan does not worry that India will take a drastic step to end this insurgency. It doesn't worry that India will cross the military line and wage a war against Pakistan. So it continues with it. Uh, this complete impunity to Pakistan's proxy war in Kashmir. A uh, lot of our military officers, senior military officers keep saying uh, this is uh, proxy war or they call it no war, no peace, or they call it uh, a situation of uh, war by other means. All sorts of names are given to it. The, the ground reality is everybody knows that Pakistan is supporting this. This insurgency has a base in Pakistan. It gets financial support from there. It gets weapon support from there. It gets uh, training uh, support from there. Forget about the moral support. Despite this, we have not been able to end this. In 2019, the government of India revoked Article 37 and uh, sorry Article 370 and declared that uh, Kashmir was an integral part of India. Every other voice was silenced. Every voice which said, no, that is not correct. It is a political dispute. It needs to be resolved. It was silenced, not only in Kashmir, but in mainline India. Directives were issued that insurgency will no longer be called insurgency. It will be called terrorism. So insurgents, which were earlier referred to as militants, are now called terrorists. Even in my magazine, in force, we call them terrorists because that's a government of India directive. Despite that, if you would have followed the news in the last one week, there have been heavy casualties suffered by the Indian armed forces. Uh, it hasn't happened in the last 15 years that in one single operation, a colonel, a major, and a deputy superintendent of the police uh, dies in action, is killed yeah. in action. Referring to the so, Anant Anantanag episode. Which happened last. Yes, yes. So this has not happened in, uh, in the last 15 years that so many senior officers would be uh, killed in action. Uh, so this is a, if you have two months of peace, we are quick to jump and say that normalcy has returned to Kashmir. But the problem is, it is not the truth. Uh, even today, uh, there has been a report that in some parts of North Kashmir, in the Uri district, uh, there has been an encounter and uh, three terrorists, infiltrators who were trying to get come into India were killed by the security forces. In August, there was another in encounter um, in the Jambu division and uh, another three uh, soldiers were killed there. So basically, we have not been able to stop Pakistan from sending trained people into India or semi-trained people into India and killing our people or our officers. So, so your, that is a measure your, of our deterrence. Your point basically is that Pakistan does not fear a military consequence to its continued support for insurgency and therefore the Pakistan does not perceive India as a major power. Is that the argument? Yes, absolutely. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, see, when 9-11 happened and President Bush declared us versus them, oh, sorry, you are with us or you're with them. Uh, yes. And General Musharraf immediately decided that he wanted to be with President Bush. So one of the uh, issues on the table at that time was that you stop support to terrorism into India. If you recall the entire decade of uh, early, two thousand, you know, late 1990s and mid to, uh, 2000, 
the decade of 2000, uh, there were a lot of incidents of terrorist violence on mainland India. Uh, there were bomb attacks in Delhi. There was bomb attacks in Bombay, Jaipur, a lot of places. Uh, there were attacks. And all of them were traced to Pakistan. There was a there was an attack on Indian parliament, if you recall. Yeah. Uh, and all of these were traced to Pakistan. But when the US told Pakistan that this has to stop, it stopped. After that, we've had no terrorist violence on mainland India. But, the, but Pakistan has been able to convince the US and the rest of the world that Kashmir is different. It, it, it's a political dispute which needs resolution and the world understands this so which is so when we say that terrorism is the biggest issue facing the uh, world uh, nobody agrees with us i mean they pay lip service to it even the un pays lip service to it but our position or the government of india position that terrorism should always stop all international agenda doesn't figure you see the g20 uh, delhi declaration there's just two or three lines on terrorism and even then they are not talking about pakistan or kashmir they are talking about financing they are talking about narco terrorism they are talking about other things because this is our position we have decided that we have to make a issue about this everywhere but the world doesn't seem to agree with us on this and Pakistan doesn't care. So that is a measure of our deterrence with against Pakistan. As far as, as China is concerned, uh, very shamefully, uh, we have said that nobody has come into our territory despite the fact that all media reports, all satellite, satellite feeds show that China is an occupation of Indian territory in Ladakh. But uh, our prime minister has said that nobody has come inside Indian territory. Nobody is occupying Indian territory. Then what, what were these rounds that we've been having with China? These rounds of uh, the, the, uh, the rounds of discussions that we've been having with China, what were these about? Uh, what was this conversation about by, uh, in South uh, Africa during the BRICS summit? when uh, we decided to operationalize the joint agree agreement signed between the Indian foreign minister and the Chinese foreign minister in uh, September 2020. So the, the point is, whatever you may project, if you want or if you choose to live in your echo chamber, uh, you will be alone. You will talk to yourself, you will hear your own voice, but it doesn't really mean anything. See the the thing with the with the Chinese uh, incursion is quite uh, an interesting thing, right? That after maybe there was uh, an exchange in '67 uh, in the northeast, but since the '70s there have been nothing, and then suddenly now in the last three four years we see at least twice China has uh, crossed the border. In fact, uh, the estimates are that it has occupied about a thousand square kilometers in Kashmir. Uh, and most international reports also suggest that. Uh, and uh, in the Northeast also, it, it entered into the territory. Uh, and uh, that also suggests that China is not very impressed with India's uh, capacity to deter China, isn't it? Actually, India has never had any capacity to deter China uh, ever. Uh, there may have been some capacity against Pakistan at one point, uh, but against China, we have never had any military capacity, which is why the government of India's position um, through the late 60s onwards has been that Chinese problem will be resolved diplomatically, not militarily. Uh, so uh, that's a tru uh, truism. Uh, as far as the recent um, incursions into India in the Ladakh sector are concerned. If you just trace, go back a little and see the statements that have, have been issued by China in the last four years, since, 19, 20, since 2019, 5th August, when the Article 370 was revoked and government of India issued new maps, it showed, it, it put a boundary to the Ladakh uh, region. The Ladakh region historically had no boundary, no internationally recognized boundary. So uh, it was an open border where people, whoever were, because it was a uh, largely Buddhist territory. So when uh, Lhasa was powerful, when the Dalai Lama's regime in Lhasa was powerful, so uh, the, the Ladakhis used to go and pay tribute to them. 
when Chinese were powerful, they used to go to uh, uh, China to pay tributes to them. So it was an open border. There, there were no uh, boundaries. Uh, but when, uh, and despite several rounds of talks with China, there were never any agreed boundaries. Even the British India could not delineate a border with China in Ladakh or with Tibet in Ladakh. So when India put a border there and uh, after 2019, Chinese immediately protested and said that you, you are actually doing what they called cartographic aggression. That when there no border existed, how can you unilaterally decide that the border runs from point A to point B? The foreign minister, uh, Mr. Jay Shankar, went to China and they, he tried to convince them that this is just for our domestic audience and this is on record. And he said, this doesn't change anything between India and China and our border talks, which have been continuing for the last several years, should continue as they were. But Chinese dug their heels, they said, you withdraw the board, the maps. India refused to do that because by that time we, has, we had raised uh, the tempo within the country to such an extent that uh, we couldn't uh, say that, you know, we made a mistake there. So it came in and it claimed the land which it had been claiming since the, sorry, since the 19, uh, late 1950s, uh, which was its original claim line of border in Ladakh. Uh, if you recall, uh, Prime Minister Nehru had a uh, long conversation, I mean, series of conversations uh, with Chinese on this, and they could never agree on the border. So the line which Chinese claimed, or the border which Chinese had claimed then, they have now come and occupied the same territory. You know, I find this, uh, uh, it is very interesting what you're saying, because when I talk to experts here in the US, they more or less say what you're saying, but when you talk to people in India, the rhetoric is so different from, from this perception that, oh, the maps have been drawn by China. Uh, but the fact that 370, uh, revocation of 370 also was the provocation for, for China to, to come in in 20. So, so th that, that is to me quite fascinating. Has that in the long run changed India's strategy and therefore India is now becoming more and more uh, aligned with the West, uh, more embedded in the Quad? in order to essentially deter China and improve its, its like, how do you see India's foreign policy post-China aggression? I think uh, India's alignment uh, with the U.S. Uh, under this rubric of Quad uh, itself shows a complete lack of uh, foresight and strategic thinking. Uh, Quad essentially is about uh, the oceans. It's essentially about the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, which now the U.S. calls the Indo-Pacific. Uh, you see the members of Quad. There's a U.S. which has huge interests in this region, in this ocean. Australia, again, an island nation, has vulnerabilities from the sea. Japan, again, vulnerabilities from the sea. But actually, we have no vulnerability from sea, from China. Our biggest vulnerability is on the land. China is in physical occupation of Indian territory. It's the entire state of Arunachal Pradesh as its territory as the Tibet. Yet we go and sign up for a defensive or a, a security mechanism which talks of threats from the sea. It has nothing to do with land. The cord or the cord nations have nothing to do with India's threat from China on land. So basically we have signed up for a security uh, arrangement or a security dialogue which addresses the concerns or insecurities of other countries, not our concerns, not our insecurities. Yeah, if you look at the Malabar uh, practices or the Malabar tra training exercises done recently in Australia, uh, and this is about Taiwan, uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, Alliance, and about containing uh, uh, China and uh, the, I mean, every statement when the Americans, uh, at least when we talk about Indo-Pacific, we talk about keeping uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, for trade routes free and also uh, containing China's aggression. Uh, I'm of the view that if there is a confrontation, God forbid, between the US and China, there will be two wars, one on the sea, which will be near Taiwan, and one on the land, and the land battle will be in India. 
Uh, do you see that as a threat? I mean, this whole rhetoric, the U.S. is putting a lot of pressure on China. If it triggers a, a conflict, do you think that India might, you know, inadvertently end up with, in a military conflict on land with China? You know, what worries me is that uh, China may not go to war with the U.S. over Taiwan. Uh, China, China uh, historically has been a nation with huge patience. It waited and waited for Hong Kong to uh, come okay. back, return to the fatherland or whatever they call it, motherland or parent nation. Uh, they waited and waited for Macau. So they can outwait for the uh, the rest of the West and Western interest in Taiwan. But my worry is that if it feels that India has become a, a adversarial power in this region, which is trying to curtail or contain China, it may just want to teach India a lesson in, a, in our backyard, in the area where we are most vulnerable. And here, China knows that none of the court countries will come to our assistance. They can help us with uh, intelligence. They can help us with equipment, but uh, they're not going to the, fight. It will be like the no, Ukraine situation. It will be like Ukraine, and uh, this will be worse because you see the you see the topography of the region. Uh, it, it's extreme high altitude. Uh, what happened in Galwan? Uh, nobody used any weapons. I mean, the weather itself kills you. So you just. Uh, it was completely armed, uh, hand to hand combat. There, there were no heavy weaponry that was used. So, here uh, we are extremely vulnerable and without realizing our own vulnerabilities and trying to secure our uh, flanks uh, on both sides, east and west. Uh, whatever the economic status of Pakistan, whatever their political problems today, the point is uh, China and Pakistan are, are very close allies. Uh, in fact, militarily, they, they have achieved uh, complete uh, interoperability. Their, their pilots operate Chinese planes, Chinese pilots operate Pakistani planes. They, they are completely in a very tight em embrace. They hold military exercises together in the uh, uh, northern Kashmir area region. So if at all China wants to teach us a lesson, even if China doesn't do it directly, uh, it can do it through Pakistan. And now you see the incidence of infiltrations are increasing in Kashmir. I don't know why they're increasing. Could could it be that uh, suddenly uh, China is helping Pakistan to needle India even more in Kashmir? Well, there is a lot of talk in India about uh, that 370, the uh, abrogation of the Article 370 have suddenly brought peace and tourism to Kashmir. And the Kashmiri people are very happy. And uh, uh, I mean, it, the, the the discussion is as if it was a magic wand that completely solved the Kashmir issue. Yet there is all of these incursions happening. Uh, what, in your view, is 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 the reality in Kashmir? I mean, clearly uh, there have been literally crores of tourists from India to Kashmir. And that would not have been possible if there wasn't uh, peace, at least all over the valley. So is the, in, is the insurgency down or, or what is happening there? See, the violence is certainly down. But if you see uh, tourism in Kashmir, uh, even in the late 1990s, tourists never stopped going to Kashmir. All through the decade of 2000, uh, year on year, tourism in domestic tourism in Kashmir was growing. I started visiting Kashmir on a very regular basis, you know, a few times every year, uh, 2003 onwards. And every year I would go there. Uh, in fact, every three months when I went there, I was told that uh, all records have been broken. So many tourists have come. So the tourists have been going to Kashmir. Uh, I mean, they never stopped going to Kashmir. As far as, and this is uh, commendable, and I you, one has to acknowledge uh, the graciousness of Kashmiri people, that no matter how bad the situation was, uh, there were never any attacks against tourists, except for a few stray incidents which happened in the early 90s against uh, foreign tourists. Uh, 
everybody knows about that. Uh, there have been never any attacks. My own parents went to Kashmir and they went all alone in 2010. And that was a time when uh, the, this round of, uh, you know, new wave of violence started, the street violence had started. And uh, they went in early summer. Uh, I, I, I didn't accompany them. And while they were there, this incident of uh, 2010 happened, the fake killing happened, uh, the Machal incident, and the streets erupted in violence. They were not harmed at all. The, the, attack, the tri driver who was escorting them took them safely to the hotel. The hotel took care of them. My mother's blood pressure shot up. They called the doctor there. So they really took care of them. There was no communication. There was the internet shut down. I could not reach out to them. So the tourists have never been harmed in Kashmir ever. Instead, um, there have been some stray incidents. So the, the fear of tourists of going to Kashmir has never been there. So do not connect tourism with uh, insurgency having ended. Uh, I want to uh, change the theme of a discussion a little bit. Uh, the last few days I've been looking at India's procurement strategies and I spoke uh, to a very prominent uh, military officer also to understand how India goes about acquiring weapons. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he did make an interesting observation about how India also uses diplomacy. Uh, one of the goals of uh, diplomacy is to get closer to other countries and they do that by buying weapons. So I was trying to figure it out as to how India does this. So the recent purchases that India has announced, for example, when Prime Minister Modi came to Washington, D.C., there was an announcement uh, of buying uh, drones, uh, some other advanced technology, about three to four billion dollars. Then when Prime Minister Modi went to France, there was this announcement of 26 uh, Rafale. And then suddenly submarines, we hadn't heard much about that discussion before that. And uh, and now in, in G20, there was this announcement of MQ-9s that India has decided to buy. So, like, what is the logic of these weapons? Are they to deter China? Are they to deter Pakistan? Uh, while there's so much talk of Atmanir Bharta uh, and making at home, India is one of the biggest the buyers of weapons from overseas. Uh you know, in uh, 2014, when the new government came in power and uh, the government had promised that uh, 15 lakhs would be transferred to everybody's account, uh, when the questions were asked of the government that where are those 15 lakhs, so they were told that that was a jumla. Don't you understand there is a difference between what is said during a campaign and what actually happens on the ground after the elections are won. So Atmanirbhar Bharat is also a jumla, a slogan. Uh, it has no basis in uh, reality. You have said that a senior officer told you that by buying of weapons is also a means of conducting diplomacy. That itself explains that these weapons are not for military use. These are for diplomatic use. So these weapons will not strengthen our military. They will only strengthen our ties with that particular country. If you want to strengthen your military, you have to ask your military what it wants and in what time frame it wants. The Indian Air Force is woefully short of fighter aircraft. Uh, it has been trying to procure or buy a, uh, a new line of fighter planes, advanced fighter planes for the last 20 years. Nothing has happened. Now, to offset this huge deficiency, the government has again approved uh, 12 uh, Sukhois, uh, 30, which yeah. will be manufactured in India by HAL, uh, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. Now, the problem with the HAL manufactured Sukhois were that the last few years, all the incidents that have happened, uh, the accidents or mm, the maintenance issues that have happened with the Sukhoi aircraft have been happening with the ones which were assembled by Hindustan Aeronautics in India. So the Air Force was not very happy with the way they were being done. This was one of the reasons why the earlier procurement program for fighter planes, which was called MMRCA, uh, fell through because uh, the government of India wanted the French company Dassault Aviation, which was the finalist, to stand guarantee for the fighters being produced by hand. They refused to do that. 
so an in, uh, indian air force refused to accept the fighters which were guaranteed by hindustan aeronautics and not by deso so this is a measure of atmanirbhar bharat for you now uh, there the, there are so many things that the government of india has been doing in the last 3 uh, uh, 4 years 2019 onwards it has uh, issued a list of items which india will not import yeah. so these are, this is called a negative list now in this list the items which are listed here are in any case not being imported they have been they are being assembled in india and they have always been assembled in india for many many years but because it makes a good copy it makes a good headline so we immediately say oh all these items we will not import we will now make in india we've always been doing that so there are a lot of these issues which uh, if you do not want to look at them you will not see them but if you want to look at them they are all right there staring at you in your face you know i was looking at this project amca project uh, advanced military combat aircraft and uh, i i was also looking at the sukhoas the sukhoas are m- more than 20 25 years old the life expectancy of these planes was 25 years and now they are trying to make it 35 years which is quite dangerous uh, and uh, and even the amca is a four for they're saying 4.5 generation but it's not a fifth generation fighter and the estimates are that amca will actually be introduced into squadrons in 2035 which is 12 years from now and the first set i mean the first test flight probably will be in 2027 uh, which uh, i was looking at some international commentators and they are betting that that is also not going to happen so imagine that in 2035 india will be flying fighter planes which are not fifth generation fl- fighters while the rest of the world with many countries which are buying f35s will be having fifth generation capabilities and already i think the united states sixth generation combat fighter has already been flight tested so what i don't understand is in the long term i understand that the the value of atmanirbhar it uh, increases scientific research technological capabilities creates jobs uh, but it, it it also in in matter of security and defense it could also be that other countries uh, are ahead china already has a fifth generation fighter called j20 it has a very funny name chengdu uh, you know but <laughs> j20 so what do you see with this amca project i mean like where are we where is india going with this thing is it just rhetoric for domestic consumption or is it uh, really a, a game changer when it comes to india's security and air force capability uh no i do not think uh, any of this will be uh, or can be regarded as game changer but yes it is a important project in the sense that it was a learning curve and uh, the development process itself would uh, is, would lead to a lot of spin offs of technologies a lot of learning uh, for the indian uh, industry but this doesn't meet the requirement of the indian air force you have you're talking of the sixth generation aircraft uh, actually already the world is talking about unmanned aircraft mm-hmm. uh, uh, so the entire premise of warfare is changing then they're also talking about aircraft uh, or they're talking about technologies where you actually may not even need uh, aircraft you know it will be completely driven by uh, drone yeah and, uh, and uh, no i'm not talking of platforms also i mean you, your warfare could probably move to another level it could move to a non kinetic level a completely non kinetic level uh, you see how the war how the warfare has evolved since uh, in, since uh, human beings came into uh, existence uh, there was a hand to hand combat and then the as your capability to create larger larger spheres in uh, improved the distance between fighters in, increased and now we are talking of stand off capabilities we're talking about capabilities where you don't even see your enemy and you can hit the enemy uh, so in the next 20 years on in the next 15 years what kind of capabilities the world will have we don't know we're talking of weapons uh, being directed uh, or being conducted uh, or managed through satellites uh, so 
a 4.5 generation fighter um, would be too late 25 or 15 years hence but it it is a learning curve so i will not say that we should not or indian industry should not uh, manufacture things but i i feel that we need to be realistic about uh, the threats we face and we have to be realistic about how we can mitigate those threats uh, our uh, political leadership uh, post independence was very sensible to understand that india cannot punch militarily above its uh, weight so they created a impression of india which was a moral nation a nation which was which was a fulcrum of all the developing worlds uh, world the uh, the nations which were struggling to get out of uh, colonialism so they give, they came to india because india provided that balance of uh, morality uh, the whole uh, non aligned movement the uh, the coming together of uh, nations or revering indian leadership so we have been a great nation and we have even today a huge potential to be a great nation to be representative of entire uh, southern world uh, you know but i don't know this competitiveness or this aspiration that we have to be a military power to counter china uh, i i don't think it is a correct approach because we are way too behind china militarily to say that we will play, we will catch up in 20 years uh, it's it's silly because in 20 years, those 20 years china is not going to sit idle and say okay you catch up with me i mean china will also advance 20 years you know so it's silly i mean your point about the nature of warfare changing is so significant uh, you know there were the movies about iron man if you have watched and so we are already here in the us talking about robot wars and so there will be no deployment of human beings at all so there will be all drones drones on the sea drones underwater drones on land drones from the space will be attacking in fact um, uh, uh, you know in the during the height of the war on terror I used to have students who were drone pilots who would be taking my classes, and uh, so one of them uh, had a very long chat, and it was very interesting. They would be flying from Nevada in Nebraska, Las Vegas, outside Las Vegas, and uh, they would be bombing in Afghanistan. So, so the distance is so enormous, and yes. so the student was talking to me about. He says it is very strange, Doctor Khan. It's like I'm playing a video game, and then. then i go home i am driving through las vegas and i'm going home there's no reality of war to me even though i am at war uh, you know it's so so safe and so far so the the world is changing uh, i want to ask you something that a lot of things that you have said in this interview and discussion uh, are not heard on many many platforms that are so jingoistic uh, about uh, india's military capabilities and uh, uh, about confronting china and it looks as if the china's economy is totally collapsed and it's just a matter of time that india will say foo and china will finish disappear so 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 why aren't there more debates and discussions in india i mean i saw the roster of writers that you have there are so many military officers who write for your magazine why isn't there a robust debate uh or hearings in the parliament uh, uh about uh, the how well prepared india really is and what really happened in galwan and other places uh i know this is a dangerous thing to talk about but i was hoping you could shed some light on that uh you know the problem in uh, amongst the military officers is that uh there's a lot of sentiment attached to uh uh what you hope your nation is so for them to accept or to say that uh, we cannot defeat china goes against that sentiment but if you dig deeper if you ask them how will you defeat china then everything comes down to the bravery of indian soldier now in a high tech world where you're talking of drones on the ground drones in the air drones in the sea uh, what will a uh, bravery of one soldier do i mean you are offering that soldier uh, as uh, fodder to be killed but people 
feel very strongly about this. They get emotional about this, that we can die for our motherland. Uh, we will not let anybody uh, come into India. It is all a very noble, it is a noble sentiment. I have complete respect for that. I mean, even I would feel uh, like this if uh, a situation arises where one has to stand up for the nation, I would also say, no, I'm right there and I'm going to defend my country. But uh, as an as a thought thinking person, as a pragmatic, reasonable person, as a person who is now uh, given the responsibility of making policies for the country, you don't have to put your citizen in in harm's way. You have to ensure how you def you in take them out of the harm's way. Uh, that is what policy making should be about. That is what leadership should be about. The leadership should not be telling you that we can defeat China when you know very well that you cannot. So only because you are brave and your soldiers are brave, and which is true, they are extremely brave. But in a high-tech war, bravery will not count. You know, uh, I do want to go back to the discussion of debate. So uh, like even I did a show where after listening to all the talk from India, I was also under the impression that if India got another provocation from Pakistan, uh, they would move in and even take over Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. You know, India just needs an excuse now uh, because India is so well prepared. But uh, uh, so far, I have not heard any response to what happened in Anantnag. Uh, there are lots of demands from the public. Uh, so, so we are having this very strange uh, situation where public uh, is under the impression that India is capable of taking Pakistan in 30 seconds uh, and giving China a bloody nose next time China uh, tries something funny. Uh, so, but why aren't there serious debates without a serious debate about capabilities? Uh, I think it's dangerous to uh, hide the crowd and the public uh, and raise their expectations Okay, in 2019, so long ago, if we could do Bala Court, uh, we can do a lot more now. Isn't that the feeling? Yes, but you see, the uh, the government and the military knows what happens in Bala Court. They know the truth about Bala Court, even if the people don't know. So they have hyped the people, they, they have conveyed to the people, look, we've done this, we hit Pakistan inside Pakistan territory. And this was something, air, air power was not used even during Kargil. And here we used it because we are not scared of Pakistan. So this is for domestic consumption. You see, this happened before the elections. And then the, the general elections happened, the government won. But the government knows the truth, that actually what happened was in Bala Court was not what it has claimed. So they cannot do anything about it. They cannot uh, indulge in any more uh, adventurism against Pakistan because uh, uh, Pakistan hit back the very next day. Now, uh, you're sitting in the US, you know the US uh, DOD confirmed that no F-16s were downed by Indian Air Force. We believe in India, people believe that Indian Air Force's MiG-21 was able to down one uh, F-16. Uh, but uh, everybody has said no, uh, no such thing happened. They, they counted all the aircraft and they, all, all the fighters are accounted for. Yeah, but uh, the popular two sets of F-16s, the ones they bought from Jordan and the ones they fought from, bought from the US. And uh, they are all there. They are all there. About yeah, so, so. Yeah. But but in, in, in India, if you say this, uh, you'll be lynched. <laughs> they, they'll say you are again, you're questioning the Indian Air Force. But the, the thing is that uh, whatever we may think, the Indian Air Force knows the truth. It knows the truth about its capabilities. It knows that uh, Pakistan was able to jam their uh, electronics. It, it knows that the communication systems were jammed, which is why the Indian fighter pilot uh, could not hear the ground uh, control telling them him to turn back. Uh, and he crossed over into POK. Uh, so they know the truth about this. But uh, it helps when the people believe otherwise, because it helps fuel nationalism. It helps fuel your faith in your uh, supreme commander. And uh, it helps win elections. 
Ghazala Wahab, thank you very much for being on the conversation. You've been so bold, so candid, and so thought-provoking. I'm sure there will be a lot of <laughs> my uh, comment section is going to simply explode with a lot of anger and hate. But it is important for people to hear about uh, some of the realities because in matters of security, I, I think uh, it is better to be realistic than jingoistic. Uh, I, I think that is very, very important. Even here in the United States, there is so much of talk about uh, uh, unrealistic uh, expectations about uh, U.S. power and then U.S. failed to achieve its political goals in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and look at uh, the mess that we have made in Ukraine. Uh, so so uh, even though there is a, a hesitancy to be critical of U.S. military and the military establishment. At least we have debates. We are, we can have uh, congressional hearings where we bring in people who are experts and academics who are free to talk about these things openly. So, uh, so thank you very much for coming uh, on the show and trying to fill that gap in, in the Indian discussion uh, on the realities of India's preparedness. Uh, and it would be a shame that everybody else in the world outside India has a, a more accurate understanding of India's military capabilities than the Indian population itself. So once again, I'm extremely grateful. Thank you for contributing a chapter to the book. Uh, please, uh, those of you who are interested in reading it, it's very well written. Uh, uh, I will post a link uh, to the book as well as uh, Ghazala's chapter in the description uh, below and uh, so please uh, also go and take a look at her Amazon page uh, for her books uh, and those of you who've been watching please if you have not subscribed to conversation do subscribe to conversations like the video uh, and uh, press the bell icon so Ghazala Wahab thank you very much thank you so much it was my pleasure <laughs>